I'm Marie Bernard, host of Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. Join me Mondays at noon as we explore the universal energy that connects us all. Let's discuss our journey of self-discovery, joy, presence, and living with authenticity. We can create positive change in the world, and it starts within each one of us. Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. Mondays at noon on CITR 101.9 FM, Vancouver. Hello and welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body and soul. I'm your host Marie Bernard and this is Synchronicity here at CITR on unceded Musqueam territory on the University of British Columbia campus. You may also be listening online at CITR.ca, CosmicDimensions.com, EmpowerRadio.com or on the Co-Creator Network. Or maybe you're watching this from my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash spiritual show, wherever you're listening from. uh, Thank you for joining us today. We have a special, I always say it's a special guest, but I actually sought Eric Maisel out. Uh, He is another author with, um, oh, people are looking at us now. I guess they can hear what's going on here at CITR. Uh, He is an author with Psychology Today. He wrote an article and I sought out uh, the publisher and he is here today. He is the author of Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life. And Eric Maisel is the author of more than 40 books, actually, which is really interesting. And he is also a coach and a psychotherapist. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hi, Marie. Great to be with you. So you talk about boot camp throughout the book because you were actually in the military. And I'm curious how you went from military man to psychotherapist and author of over 40 books. Oh, golly. There was a long... <laughs> there was a long uh, intermediary period between the one and the other. So I I enlisted when I was 18, and I got out when I was 21. And um, like so many people throughout history, maybe especially nowadays, I had no idea what I was going to do next. And so I got a degree in philosophy from the University of Oregon. That's the thing you do when you don't know what you're going to do next. <laughs> and then I started writing fiction. That That was really my first life. I spent about 10 years as a fiction writer and a ghost writer, and then I became a therapist, and then I became a coach. So it's been a long journey from that um, youthful military time to, uh, what is it now, 50 years later. (laughs) Wow, wow. So I'm I'm guessing now that if you're the author of Life Purpose Boot Camp, that what you're doing now is one of your purposes in life? That's exactly right, and the way you said it is the way I like it to be said, namely that we have multiple purposes. People get hooked on that idea of there being one purpose to life, the purpose of life, and I do think that that's a a place where we get stuck when we think there's only one thing that matters in life. I think the idea of creating a menu of life purpose choices, kind of articulating for ourselves the many different sorts of things that are meaningful or that matter or that are important, and then figuring out how to get some of those things from our menu onto our daily to-do list. That's one of the huge challenges in life is moving from knowing what's important to getting those important things onto our to-do list. So yes, that's exactly right. This is one of my life purpose choices. I'm curious what some of your other life purpose... I, I like that you use the word choices. What are some of your other choices? One is the relationship one. I'm in a long-term marriage of, I better get this right, something like (laughs) 37 years, thereabouts. And we have children. So I have multiple relationships, children, grandchildren, wife, friends. I think relating is important. I work with creative performing artists a lot as a creativity coach. Many of them don't actually value relationships as much as creating, and they end up feeling very cold in life because, yes, they've got a large inventory of paintings, but they have no friends. So one of my life purpose choices is to relate. Another is activism. I believe in many different sorts of things. Right now, I'm in the mental health advocacy world where we're looking at alternatives to the current method of diagnosing. My most current book that comes out in December is The Future of Mental Health, And the subtitle is Deconstructing the Mental Disorder Paradigm. That is really trying to look at 
whether there are such things as mental disorders or whether that's just a label for living. And so activism is another one of my important life purpose choices, etc. It's interesting. We will have to have you back on the show when the future of mental health comes out. And and in the introduction to your book, there's uh, a really amazing example of someone who went through your eight week boot camp online and he was actually suicidal at one point and I guess it's because he didn't really have a grasp on what meaning was to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, psychiatry especially, psychotherapy too, but psychiatry especially doesn't ask the question, what's important to you? It looks at symptom pictures and other things, but a psychiatrist typically won't ask How do you make meaning? What are your life purposes? Those aren't questions that get asked of patients or clients who come in in distress. But an awful lot of people are suffering in that existential place of not knowing what matters to them, not understanding where to throw their human capital in life. They know how to get through them. We all know we can get through the motions. You know, we can get through our to-do list. We can check things off. But ultimately, that doesn't feel very satisfying, and we get what's typically nowadays called depressed, although I would say it's sad or despairing. And so it's really important for people to try to identify where they want to throw themselves in life and into what sorts of things they want to really invest. And I use language like meaning opportunities and meaning investments to try to get at the idea that we have to make investments in things that we consider important or else we're going to feel that life is flat. Hmm. I really like how you differentiate between the the meaning opportunities and the behaviors because it is so true, especially, I think, in our current age. Um, people think, well, if I do X, then I will feel that feeling of meaning. I'll feel that passion. And so we go about our days trying to trying to experience meaning and excitement. And like you said, we often fall flat of that because it's not necessarily the, um, the action or the experience that's going to give us that feeling. That's right. And many of the things that we do in the service of meaning don't feel meaningful. By that I mean... Let's say you're, you believe in a certain cause and you volunteer and your job this week given to you as a volunteer is to lick envelopes. And so you lick five trillion envelopes this week. You know exactly why you volunteered. The cause is meaningful to you. But the week of licking envelopes may not have felt meaningful at all. And that's really a poignant truth about the human experience is that we can make decisions about things that are meaningful to us, like getting a Ph.D. in something or doing this or doing that. And the whole experience of doing that thing, the getting of the Ph.D., doesn't feel meaningful. Mm -hmm. So people spend an awful lot of time in life doing things which, in the back of their mind, they have decided to do because they they do believe they are meaningful things, but the experience itself doesn't feel meaningful. Creative and performing artist I work with, you know, you, you may spend a year or two years writing a novel and you know exactly why you're writing it. With some reason in you why you decided to embark upon writing this novel. But 400 of those 600 days, you may feel nothing but hatred for your novel. Hmm. You may not be liking it. And so there you sit saying, well, okay, I'm doing exactly what I intended to do, write this novel, and I hate what I'm doing. I think that's a very poignant truth about life, is that we may be doing exactly what we're doing for good reasons and not enjoying it. Mm. So that's I, <laughs> that's the challenge, because especially in our disposable instant gratification society, it's so difficult I know for myself, it's so difficult to accept that. And so right. a lot of people, myself included, tend to start a lot of things and not finish them. That's exactly right. For for that reason, they know why they started it. They know it's important. And the experience just doesn't match the vision of how it was going to feel. That's why if you have a menu 
of life purpose choices or meaning opportunities, then you can include some things on your daily to-do list that won't say are guaranteed to give you the experience of meaning, but that are likely to. Let's say you've put in four hours in your no- on your novel, and that's been a rough experience that day. Well, if you can turn to something else on your life purpose menu that you kind of know always works to give you experience of meaning, like holding your child's hand and crossing the street, <laughs> or something simple, walking in nature, if you can remember that there are other things that also give you experience of meaning, then you can include them on your day. And that does it, that helps a little to reduce the experience of the meaninglessness of the other hours. Hmm. Are there things that you can do? Actually, let's, uh, first of all, I want to say we're speaking right now with Eric Maisel. He is a coach and a psychotherapist, Life Purpose Boot Camp is the name of his book, The Eight-Week Breakthrough Plan for Creating a Meaningful Life. And Eric, I'm curious if there are things that you can do. You mentioned doing other things in your day that may give you the opportunity to experience that feeling of purposefulness and meaningfulness. But are there things that you can do to make that activity that you're doing, like working on your book, more meaningful, even though it doesn't feel that way in the moment? I think there are. I think there are tactics and strategies. I think one tactic is a morning meaning check-in or a morning life purpose check-in where you remind yourself why you're doing the things you're doing. You know, if doing X is feeling hard, then reminding yourself of its importance to you may help some in in having you understand why you're doing this hard thing today. So reminding yourself each day, I think, is one important tactic. Another important tactic, and I find this very interesting, that's the idea of a life purpose icon. As you know, people who believe in Christianity or Judaism, they get so much meaning out of their Christian cross or Star of David, the physical object that they can wear around their neck matters, and it's kind of a touchstone and holds a ton of information about their belief system in that little physical icon. Well, most people don't think of making an icon for themselves that does that kind of work, but you can. And when people think about the thing that I'm saying, creating a life purpose icon, almost immediately something comes to mind to each individual, something comes to mind, and it's different for each person. It might be a lightning bolt or a tree or a this or a that. But if you were to dream up your life purpose icon and then have it fabricated and actually have it available to you, that can help remind you why you're serving soup in the soup kitchen or slogging through your novel or what have you. It helps remind you of the choices you've made in life. So I think on the tactical level, on the strategic level, there are many things one can do to keep meaning afloat during these activities or experiences that aren't feeling that meaningful. Hmm. Eric, you mentioned that some of your, that you're a creativity coach and you work with a lot of creative people and that they don't, some, some of your clients don't value things like relationships and whatnot as much as their, their art. Do you, I mean, how, how do you go about changing that, or do you need to change that view? Should they just focus on their art and nothing else? I'm pretty pushy, so I do um, (laughs) (laughs) advise-demand that uh, clients think about their relationship needs. Even if they haven't brought it up, I'll bring it up. So I'm I'm quite directive in that sense, because I think that often a creative person coming to a creativity coach won't think to bring up you know, I haven't been in a strong relationship for 18 years or something. They won't think to bring that up. They think they're talking about their block with their current novel. So I will bring it up, and I will say it's probably the case that life would feel better if you had an intimate other or somebody, one advocate in your life, one supporter, one this, one that. And so what do you think? And then if the person says, I, do not, I absolutely refuse, I do not want to talk about that, well, okay, 
then that's that. And I think that will be a problem for that person, but I won't push beyond that. But most people, when I bring it up, say, yes, that's a sore point, a sore place. I've had many um, fractured relationships, and I understand the value of relationships. I'm, quote, just not good at it, unquote. That's typically what a creative person will say. I'm just not good at it. Just as they'll say about marketing and promoting themselves, I'm just not good at it. Mm. And then I have to say, well, let's get better. Let's get better at that. I, I will not accept I'm not good at that as kind of meaning that you're not good at that for all time. That's interesting, and, Eric. Oh, sorry, you were going to say something else? No, and I was just going to say, and so we may end up spending whole sessions on whether this online dating service is better than that online dating service. <laughs> you know, we may go, get to the nitty-gritty of relationships um, pretty rapidly. The client may think that we're talking about writing his novel, and we are, but then suddenly, somehow, three weeks later, we're talking about is. Uh, Okay, Cupid better than some other <laughs> site. <laughs> That's so funny. It's interesting you you say how people will say I'm just not good at that. Um, a friend and I were talking about the um, the concept of introversion, and people will say, "Well, I'm an introvert." So that's why I sit in the corner and I don't talk to anyone in a party. And and that just not good at it is kind of a way of letting ourselves off the hook instead of moving forward, even though, I mean, I'm at least somewhat extroverted and I still have trouble striking up conversations with new people. It's uncomfortable, but I sure, do it anyway right. because I know it's good for me. Yeah, and when I frame it theoretically, I do this in books, I wouldn't be saying this to a client, it's too theoretical, but in books I talk about personality being made up of three parts original personality, formed personality, and available personality. I think it's a pretty robust model to help folks think about personality. So maybe as a, as a matter of original personality, maybe you were born a little sadder than the next person or a little more sensitive than the next person or a little more anxious than the next person or a little more introverted than the next person. Okay, that's who you are. That's part of your endowment. Then over time, you get formed in a certain way, so that may become even stronger in you. You get set more sad over time or more anxious over time. But for most human beings, there's still some percentage of available personality left. That's our remaining freedom to be the person we intend to be, the person we decide to be. And that amount, if you want to think of it as an amount, is going to be more for one person and less for another person, or more or less for the same person, depending on where they are in life. If you're currently alcoholic, you have less available personality. And then if you enter recovery over time, you have more available personality. So this model helps us think about the thing that we're talking about. Namely, if you say, this just isn't me, I would say to you, okay, maybe as a function of your original personality, it isn't you. Who do you want to be, though? Hmm. Or who do you need to be to manifest your intentions? Who do you need to be? Do you need to be that extroverted person to manifest your intentions? Probably you do. In that case, then you have, you have available personality to use to do the work you need to do to make yourself proud. So as you can tell, I won't let a person stay with, that's just not me. I love that. Who do you want to be? And then who do you need to be in order to, to, to fulfill this chosen purpose? That's right. That's right. And many people don't have that chosen purpose, so they're, they're not fighting to become the person they ought to be because they don't have the purpose. And that's why the starting place for so much of the work I do with people is first demanding that they believe they matter, and then having them fight to articulate in what ways they're going to matter, what, are, what will their life purpose choices be. It's not easy work for a lot of people because mm -hmm. they don't really believe that they do matter. I can make them say it, but that's not the same as them believing it. Wow. And that is the work for an awful lot of people to actually believe that they do matter, that this time on earth counts, that certain things are more important than other things, etc. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Well, we will be back with more synchronicity in just a moment. Right now, we are speaking with Eric Maisel. He is the author of Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life, which isn't that what so many of us want. We'll be back with more synchronicity momentarily. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we are speaking with Eric Maisel. He is the author of over 40 books, uh, Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life is the one we're talking about today. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Great to be back. Thank you. So we were talking, just before the break, we were talking about helping people believe that they matter. I mean, my goodness, I guess... I mean, we are kind of, when you look from a universal perspective and on the planet from, you know, the moon, we're just little specks of dust, um, I, I guess. That's right. <laughs> I, I, think, I think all first world contemporary people, even if they're believers, still harbor that wonder if they're just excited matter and if they do matter and if the universe does care about anything. I think even believers harbor those doubts because we just have a scientific tradition and a materialistic tradition, materialistic in the sense not of money, but in the sense of material world and ideas about evolution and what have you. So I think everybody harbors the wonder about whether they do matter. And so I just have to reconvince people that they matter to themselves at least. At least they matter to themselves. They know what makes themselves proud, or at least they can, if if they're not in denial about things, they can understand what makes them proud. They know that gaining 163 pounds doesn't make them proud. They know that believing in some issue, advocating for some cause, makes them proud. And if they don't do it, that doesn't make them proud. If they've gotten their master's in writing and they've always loved books and they've never started on their novel, that doesn't make them proud. So they know what does and doesn't make them proud and and how they would matter to themselves if only they were devoted to themselves. Pavarotti has a quote I like, which is, people say I'm disciplined, but it's not discipline, it's devotion, and there's a big difference. So I try to remind people, we don't have to white-knuckle life and look for more discipline, do things via discipline. What we need is more devotion, devotion to ourselves. Devotion is a synonym for, you know, love and passion and enthusiasm and interest and other words like that. We want to be passionate about life and interested in life and, in a certain sense, attached to life, which is its own big issue because we also have to figure out how to be detached simultaneously. There's an interesting dance that we all have to do as human beings between attachment and detachment. But basically, we want to be attached. We want to care about things. We don't want to be so neutral, so detached that nothing matters to us. I don't think that's what we really want for ourselves from life. Hmm. Eric, it sounds like whether we can answer the question of how much does one person matter in the greater scheme of things? You were saying, well, I mean, you're here to live this life. That's right. You may as well make the most of it. You may as well do the most that you can with it, whether in 100,000 years it's going to matter or not. Who cares? You're here now. That's right. Plus, it actually um, helps you emotionally to be doing the things that matter to you. There, There are lots of interesting new studies about people with life purpose having healthier lives than people without life purpose. In a way, that's just intuitively sensible, but there are, there are new scientific studies that show that. But on a, a sort of a simple, straightforward level, people are paying much too much attention to their moods. And when do we check in on our moods when we're not happy, when we're in a bad mood, when we're down? Most people don't check in on their mood when they're happy and say, wow, I'm in such a good mood. And so by just reminding yourself that that meaning can trump mood, that is, by focusing on what's important to you rather than what mood you're in, 
you can lead a life that's emotionally healthier. Give you a concrete example. In the days before D Day, we really don't care what mood Eisenhower is in. We don't care if he's sad or anxious or anything. We want him to make the invasion work. We need him to do his work. We need him to take his work seriously. Well, everybody expects an Eisenhower would, because that work is, so to speak, so important. We don't see our own life as a series of D Day invasions, we don't see our own life as that important. But if we could, then we would understand that checking in on our mood all the time is not a worthwhile thing to do, that getting the important work done is the worthwhile thing to do, rather than regularly checking in on how we're feeling. I really um, I identify with... There, there's... Uh, an example of one of your clients in the book where she was having trouble even with the first exercise, which is to start making a list of things that you find meaningful. There's, there's a few mm -hmm. as aspects. And she sounded just like me. Like she jumps from project to project and, yeah. and it's kind of like, well, this doesn't feel good anymore. Or I don't know. I mean, it's hard, I guess, um, if you don't have this vision of how it's going to look when it's done, it's like trying to put a puzzle together without any pictures, in any picture to help you. That's um, right. What do you do for people like her, like me? Well, I tell them that, well, there are a couple of things. One is you have to make strong choices. You just do. And they are whole, they are provisional choices, but they're wholehearted choices. And you have to actually commit to your own choices. And choosing provokes anxiety. Choosing between should I write my novel or paint my painting, that kind of choice provokes anxiety. So that means that anxiety is going to thread through this process of choosing. And therefore, you're going to need some anxiety management strategies, and I can name 20 of them for you. <laughs> So that's a piece of the puzzle is you're going to have to make choices. Choosing provokes anxiety. Here's what we're going to do about that anxiety. So that's one piece of it. And the other is um, selling people on the idea of process, the reality of process. Not an airy-fairy, smiley-faced view of process, but the reality of process, which might mean spending two years on a novel that doesn't work. That's the truth about process. Or having only 80% or 20% of the things we ever try come out well. That's the truth about process. How many of Bob Dylan's 103,000 songs are wonderful? You know, 18, 24, 36. And he's still a great artist. But 92% of what he does isn't great. 92% of what many great artists do isn't great. So what I'm trying to help people do is come to a mature understanding of process and reality and stop having them need this guarantee that the thing they're embarking upon is going to work. We have to stop that, stop needing that guarantee. I'm only going to start this novel if you can assure me that it's going to work beautifully. Mm. Not only can I assure you, there's a high likelihood it won't work beautifully. Wow. Can you live with that? Can you as a human being, as a mature, sensible human being, deal with the reality of process? Hmm. That's interesting, Eric, because uh, I could, I mean, in anything that we choose to, to move forward with, for me, it's, it's in dating. I notice that when I get into a relationship, there's a lot of things like when it's brand new, there's a lot of anxiety. Does he like me as much as I like him? Is it going to work out? Does he have the things that I need? And a lot of the times, I think the anxiety comes from that feeling that I have to make the right choice in this moment rather than just right. putting one this step in front of the matters other. matters so much. Yep. Mm -hmm. Setting the bar in a certain place too early. And, and the fact is that whether you're writing a novel that ends up garbage or you're in a relationship that mm -hmm. ends up a tragedy, you as if you're present throughout the journey, you're actually better equipped for the next novel or the next relationship. 
That's exactly right. And there's an and. And if you can get out sooner rather than later, that's a good thing, whether it's the novel or the relationship. Um, I did a Life Purpose Boot Camp um, interview conference where I interviewed folks from different walks of life about their life purpose choices and what have you. And I learned a really interesting thing accidentally through that process. And that's how long it took people to make a change even after the meaning had completely drained out of the thing they were currently doing. I'll give you one example. There was a woman um, who was a nun and she was um, high up in um, the Vatican and was... Uh, Mother Teresa's sort of right-hand nun, (laughs) and was well-positioned, but at some point she stopped believing in Mother Teresa and God and what have you. Everything. Her order, she stopped believing. But it still took her five years to leave the church, five or six years. And that's we understand why. You just can't overthrow your belief system by snapping your fingers, plus there's no guarantee that the next thing you choose to believe in is going to satisfy you. So whether it's a belief system, there was a professor I interviewed who for five or six years had known that he hated teaching classes he was teaching. He no longer cared about music composition. He knew it inside out, but he just couldn't stomach teaching it. And he left and he he had to create a sort of self-created career to match what was meaningful to him. This is all by way of saying maybe it's going to take the full five or six years to get out of a situation even though you know you're going to get out. You know, we know, we're positive, we're we're going to have to get out of this ultimately, but it's just too hard to get out of it now. Well, if there's any way to shorten that time from five or six years to a year, metaphorically, then that would be important to know how to do for an individual. And I think that can save a lot of grief and angst to make strong choices, but then also to be very aware of when that choice isn't panning out and when we have to make a new choice, and then try to make that change as expeditiously as we can. Eric, I'm curious. Um, I, I totally agree that you don't want to spend way longer than is helpful or useful or purposeful <laughs> in a situation. But at the same time, as an example, um, with my relationship, I'm starting to see that in all likelihood, this is not going to be my last relationship, unfortunately. However, mm-hmm. I'm enjoying the relationship now, and I am continually learning new things that I that would serve me to work on. And so therefore, at the moment, I'm staying in hopes that things will turn out the way that I'd like them to. But also because I don't, I don't feel like it's helpful for me to just leave this relationship, looking for a new one still dealing with this issue I know I'm aware of. Does that make sense? Well, well, that was a very complex. I mean, there was a lot of things (laughs) in that sentence. Because up until the point where you said, in the beginning you said, I know it's not my last relationship. Mm -hmm. Then later on you said, I still hope something. Mm -hmm. And so up until the point of the hope, I was buying it. (laughs) (laughs) That is, you know, the way you were saying it, that you you had an understanding about it, maybe not, or certainly not being the last one, but that you were enjoying aspects of it, etc. All of that made sense. Then you got to the point of hoping after hope or good money after bad or something you were saying there, it sounded like. So were we working together about stuff? That, that's the, I would have that question right there about realistic hope, 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 hope against hope. If it's about hope, then that feels like that needs some investigating. Hmm. Can you, you know say more I mean? about that? What do you mean? Like, am I setting myself up for disappointment if there's still hope? Yes, or um, keeping yourself hooked when, I mean, in the, be- the first thing you said was, I will be getting out of this. <laughs> 
I'm not sure that's the way you said it, but that's the way I heard it, Mm -hmm. is that ultimately I will be getting out of this. And then you gave your reasons for not getting out now, one of which was I'm enjoying it. That seemed like a good reason. But another reason was maybe I'm wrong in believing that I need to get out of it. And that one I wasn't so sure about because you sounded clear at the beginning of the sentence about knowing something, and then it got unclear later in the sentence. So I I don't think I'm saying anything exactly, but more in my hearing of it, something seemed to change as you went along that sentence. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, I guess my question is, is there value in staying in something that's impermanent, as everything is? Um, Not if you're needing another human being to change. Hmm. If it's about, this would be a wonderful relationship if only I X, great. Then you have work to do on you, and then there is hope. But if it's about the other person, uh, this is not about you now, let me just say more generically, if you're not respected in a relationship, get out. If you're abused in a relationship, get out. Etc. There, there are there are reasons to get out. Where if you're hoping, we know abused women want to hold on to the hope that the apology that the guy gives matters, and that things will be different down the road. Well, anybody counseling that person would know to say, "Stop that! Stop pinning your hope on him changing. That's just not sensible, not realistic." So the staying in the relationship or the staying with anything, insofar as you have control, it's about you or something you can actually influence, great. Then there's work for a human being to do there, person to do there. But if it's about changing the other person, I, I think we all know that that's not really fruitful. Mm-hmm. Well, in this situation, I feel like it's, there's work for both of us. We we came together with the intention of working on ourselves um, mm-hmm. as a team, and we've been mm-hmm. we've been doing that. Whether it will be whether we'll be together ten years from now, probably not. That's right. Well, that's added information. If you're saying, you know, that you're working on something, but he's also willingly working on something, that's added information. You know, each thing you say produces kind of refined vision in my mind of what I would want to say. Mm-hmm. And that's how therapy or coaching or anything works, is that, you know, the, the more you speak and say, the more things change. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, Eric, um, it is time for a break. And I'm just really quickly, um, where, where should people pick up your book, Life Purpose Boot Camp? At their local bookstore, if one exists, <laughs> or um, at the cyberspace bookstores, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And I would invite folks to come to my site and see the things I do. It's ericmaisel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. I offer all kinds of workshops and trainings, writing workshops and creativity coaching trainings and all sorts of things so folks can come visit there and see what's going on. Awesome. Well, we are speaking right now with Eric Maisel. And again, his website is ericmaisel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L. And he is the author of many books, but the one we're talking about today is Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life. This is Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we are speaking right now with Eric Maisel, the author of Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life. And Eric, you talk a lot about meaning, um, I think more so than purpose in the book. And how are how exactly, in your definition, are meaning and purpose related? Meaning, meaning is an experience and purpose is a choice. For thousands of years, we've had the metaphor of seeking meaning, being a seeker of meaning, that 
the idea being that meaning somehow was out there, something like a lost purse or a lost document or a lost something that we had to go searching for. Maybe it was at the top of a mountain or in some book or someplace out there. I've been arguing for the paradigm shift from seeking meaning to making meaning, the idea that we know enough about life and know enough about our own lives to decide which sorts of experiences are meaningful to us. And they may be surprising ones. They may not be the ones that we thought were going to be meaningful. But, so, but meaning to me, to my mind, is merely, merely in quotes, merely a subjective psychological experience, like other experiences, like joy or hatred or other experiences. It's a special kind of one, but that's all it is. But because of that's all it is, an experience, like other experiences, we can have more of it. It's really a renewable resource in a certain sense. We can do the sorts of things that in the past have provoked that experience, whether that's having a conversation with our Aunt Rose or writing a book or whatever it is. We can actually create meaning by doing the sorts of things that in the past have felt meaningful. And to use that other language of meaning opportunities, we can try new things that we have an intuition might feel meaningful in the doing. So meaning is an experience. Life purpose, by contrast, is a choice. I don't think we actually have any life purposes until we decide what they are. Otherwise, I think we're just going through the motions in our kind of animalistic or reflexive or instinctual place of, I need food, I need a job, I need to pay bills, etc., etc. So that, for me, is the major distinction. And so life purpose trumps meaning. That is, life purpose is more important than meaning in the sense that knowing how we want to live is more important than any particular experience we may be feeling, like the experience of meaning. In this model, it's a natural question to ask how much meaning do we actually need, namely, how many meaningful experiences do we need on a day? Like, how many joyful experiences do we need? We don't need a day of complete joy. It doesn't might, even, might overwhelm us, exhaust us, to have a day of complete joy. I don't think we need a day of complete meaning. I think we need as much meaning as we need. And that allows for a vision where, okay, so maybe parts of the day I can spend in what I call meaning neutral, where I don't pester myself about the meaningfulness of life. Maybe they aren't particularly meaningful parts of the day. Maybe the commute just isn't particularly meaningful. But I don't have to ask myself about the meaningfulness of life while I'm commuting. It's the wrong moment to ask that question. If I understand my life purposes, if I understand that this commute is in the service of getting me someplace that's important to me, or however that is, then I can understand that the exact number and amount of experiences of meaning is less important than me decisively standing behind my life purposes. Um, Eric, I just thought of something when you're talking about the commute not being meaningful, but it's in service to that greater purpose. Mm -hmm. But I, it just occurred to me that there are some things that you could add more meaning to, like if one yes. of your purposes is, is learning or personal growth, then you could be listening to books on tape during your awful That's commute. That's exactly right. We can, we can create the experience of meaning. We can, we can make meaning in, in the sense in which you just said. Let's say the commute is meaningless. We can turn it, maybe, you know, if we're lucky, we can turn it into a meaningful or a more meaningful experience by listening to a book on tape. Exactly. So rather than seeking meaning out there, needing to go to a workshop or India or someplace, we can have this conversation with ourselves, what would make the commute more meaningful? What would make my job more meaningful? What would make my morning more meaningful? Etc. We can have this conversation with ourselves and come up with quite concrete answers like book on tape kinds of answers. Interesting. So even, if, I, I think so many of us um, 
and I keep bringing it back to the disposability and the instant gratification mm -hmm. and the keeping up with the Kardashians mentality where we have this, a lot of us have this idea of if I could just get it so that life was easy and nothing bad ever happened, I didn't have to do any hard work, then I'd be happy. Yeah, and no one committed suicide at a higher rate than aristocrats. <laughs> That isn't the answer, because our meaning needs don't go away because um, we have a, a, a steady, in, an independent income, or because we have gold faucets. Our meaning needs don't go away, and our life purpose needs don't go away. In fact, I don't think we're after happiness in life. I think we're out to make ourselves proud. And the hunt for, or the search for, or the, the journey towards happiness, I think, is a fairly fruitless journey hmm. so a lot a lot of what america is based on the pursuit of happiness is that's right we want that right i mean we want to be <laughs> we want to be free to pursue happiness we want it as a right or as a freedom but it's still a mistake <laughs> mistake in the sense that we're not living our val we're not living our values if we're chasing happiness. Let's, we could name any kind of value, any kind of activist value. Let's say it's um, speaking up in the service of some unpopular cause. If you speak up in the service of some unpopular cause and people throw rocks through your window, etc., you're not going to feel very happy. Happiness is not the word that arises in a conversation around people throwing rocks through your window. <laughs> but it may be exactly the thing you know you need to do. So I don't think thinking about happiness or chasing happiness is what we're after. I think standing up for our standing up for what's important for, to us is what we're after. And we disappoint ourselves by virtue of the fact that we don't stand up for what's important to us enough. I think a lot of people are both disappointed in themselves and pre-disappointed in trying out the things that they think they would like to do because they doubt that they're going to have the resolve to follow through. It's the diet syndrome. You know, you may be disappointed in your weight and pre-disappointed about being able to pull off your next diet effort so you know you're not going to really do it. Hmm. So I think a lot of people are in that disappointed and pre-disappointed sad place. Well, it's interesting, Eric, you also mentioned conflicting values. Um in the book, and you talked about speaking up for things that, that are that's right. And I'm actually this is something that I've had to kind of balance and, and play more in the gray area of life, because I used to always be very clear on what doing the right thing at all costs, uh -huh. generally, at my own cost. And what would happen yeah. is, I would yeah. speak up. Yeah. I and and Nothing would change because of it other than my life would get worse. That's right. Whistleblowers don't fare well. Yeah. So I've stopped doing that now, but then I have to kind of look at it from a different viewpoint because even though I do feel that it might be – in the past it might have been right to speak up, if that's not going to result in any positive change, then it's not helpful to anyone. That's right. And you may change your mind. Yet again, and you may go to the place of, I can't know that it wouldn't serve somehow, that it wouldn't change. I can't know if being an activist in some cause wouldn't be a good thing. So these things shift. We can go back and forth around the sorts of things you just said. I think that's, again, one of the poignant features of life. Life is that our values do shift. We believe one we. We may believe in a war our country is fighting, and then we get new information, and then the next day we're against the war our country is fighting. These are kind of cataclysmic shifts in a human being, to, to be on one side of a thing one day and on the other side of the thing the next day. And yet I think that that's, I think we want to be open to those kinds of changes because they mean that we're really taking in new information and we're really honoring where we are. We're, we're honoring our context on a given day, on a given moment, things may have shifted and we want to shift with them. So it's not necessarily selling out if our values change. 
it is it is not selling out if our values change. It's selling out if we sell out. Mm. No, if our, no, it is not. It is not selling out if our values change because they may change for completely good reasons or reasons that we believe are good. I'll give you an example of my own life, and this is a place of confusion for me, so I'm going to say something more clearly than I actually feel it or believe it. I've always been against um, nuclear energy, power plants, that sort of thing. And then in the context of looking at the future and oil running out and what have you, I can feel myself changing my mind about nuclear energy and moving to a position that I never in a billion years would have thought I would take on the side of nuclear energy. So this is not me suddenly, you know, being able to make money from this is not a shift in values for any economic reason. This is just me trying to think through what I actually believe about things. And it will be very funny to me if I actually end up on the other side of an issue that I I thought I had 100% clarity about. And I think if we are if we are standing open to life, then these sorts of shifts do happen. We may still make we may make a mistake. We may still have the wrong information or come down on the wrong side of things or what have you. But that process of trying to follow our values to their logical conclusions can cause exactly those kinds of large shifts. Eric, I'm curious how often, because it sounds like we need to make choices, we need to get comfortable with feeling that anxiety around making a choice. And at the same time, we need to have flexibility for, for situations, yes. changing circumstances, the new information. So how often would you recommend, if at all, that people reevaluate their choices or their values? I think there are two kinds of answers to that. If you were a creative person working on a novel, I would advise that you err on the side of completing things. Because I don't think I think a lot of creative and performing artists don't get enough information from their own efforts because they don't complete things. So that may sound a little paradoxical because earlier I was saying, you know, check in a lot and if it's not working, blah, blah, blah. But I do think there's some real value in completing things that even are not, that you may have a good tingle down your spine aren't working. You may know that this novel you're working on really just doesn't feel very alive. There still may be real value in completing it for the sake of really understanding the process of what it means to do a draft and a second draft and a third draft and send it out and get rejected, et cetera, et cetera. There may be value in that whole cycle. So that's why I say there are two kinds of answers. One is stick with things. <laughs> and this, is a, this was the stick with things um, wrap. And then there is the other, which is try to get out of things that aren't working sooner rather than later. And maybe one wants to check in very formally, like once a month about A, B, and C, to see if A, B, and C are still holding. And that may be too mechanical, but I think you know what I mean metaphorically, of really checking in quite frequently as to whether a certain activity or enterprise or even way of being is working. So I think both things are true, and it's not really a paradox. I think both things are true. We do want to stick with things for the sake of giving them our best shot and seeing things to completion. And at the same time, we want to drop things that aren't working sooner rather than later. Sounds like a balancing act. So, Eric, uh, we're just about out of time. DJ Chris Zerific is in the studio for his show, Parts Unknown. And I'm just wondering, what what do you think is the most important thing that you want potential readers of Life Purpose Boot Camp to, to know before they pick up your book? That there are two sides to or two things to remember about life purpose. One is that it's a choice. These are choices we make. And having made them, we have to manage to get them onto our daily to-do list. So those are the two most important things. Make strong life purpose choices. They may change, but make them strongly and then actually live them.
Mm, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you. Again, your website is ericmazel.com. That's E R I C M A I S E L.com. The name of the book is Life Purpose Bootcamp, the eight week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life. And now, if people are kind of like me and they maybe need a little bit more motivation to complete these tasks. Are you still doing the online boot camp? Um, I'm not doing the online boot camp. I'm doing a live one. I believe the next one is at the Cropalo Retreat Center in Lenox, Massachusetts in March. So I'm doing some live ones in the world, but I'm not doing the online one at this moment. All right. Well, again, you can find more information about the book at ericmazel.com. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. It's been great being here. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day. So again, that was Eric Maisel, and he's a psychotherapist as well as a coach. He's authored more than 40 books, and the latest one, uh, Life Purpose Boot Camp, the eight-week breakthrough plan for creating a meaningful life. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. DJ Chris Rific is up in just a moment here on CITR, and he's joined by, it looks like, his wife and his daughter. His sister. And oh, his daughter. sister. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't, so have, I haven't met your wife before, have no, I? I don't know. Anyway, hi, hi. But you... You're so big. I was expecting... My, my sister? A, no. <laughs> Your daughter, how old is she now? Three. Three? It's been that long? Yes. I just, every time I picture her, I think of a baby. Yeah. You're such a big girl. I'm not a baby. No, you're, you're not. a girl. Wow. Well, it's really nice to meet you. So I better get my, out of here. My name is Sylvie Pearl. Her name is Sylvie Pearl. Sylvie Pearl. It's lovely to meet you, Sylvie Pearl. All right. Well, uh, DJ Chris Arefic coming up in just a moment. I'm going to close the song with a close the show with a song by Surya Devi. Want to send you lots and lots of love. Be well. Namaste. Namaste.